I think it's a love fest when you walk into the Lahaya Center. So I would give you like a couple of minutes. Maybe we should officially start like 10 minutes later so that you can have, I just don't want, you know, could you be saying, yes. Of course. Talk about tonight. And see, we have this the guest here, Rabbi Stephen Beacon, Dr. Lahaya Center. For those that are home, needless to say, we are so I come back and every time I come back, I'm more and more filled with incredible pride and nachas. Joy and seeing what sure. I got to do here. Yes, really amazing. Just seeing everybody, you know, Ali and I send love to everybody. A couple of upcoming things tonight. Um, I'm going to be here teaching at 7 30. Chat GPT and me, Jewish perspective on how to use this new technology. It's an important topic. Bring your kids if you're interested. Um, NASA Social coming up. Anybody who wants to still join, it's on Sunday the 25th. There's fly there are flyers here. Going to be an amazing event. I'm playing barbecue. Yeah. If anyone wants to join the barbecue, keep your eyes open for what we're working on this right now. But we have the uh, the Netflix Jewish matchmaker, Lisa Ben Shalom, coming. It's going to be unbelievable. It's going to be probably. I would say definitely the biggest event of Hunter Jew ever had. It's like, you know, getting like the Rome from Spada. It's you know, equivalent of getting the Rome together. So definitely keep your eyes open for that. And I'm telling you, just stick it to one you want to jump on because they are, we are going to sell it no matter how big our, our venue is. Uh, one thing is, anyone knows of a very big venue that will give it to us either a gift or a, an expensive rate. We touch base. Oh, so, yeah. We have a we're following on a bunch. Like for how many? The well, last thing is the new addition to the Lahaim Center is the gift jar. It's a couple of suggested donations for class. I just did it four times. <laughs> It's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you tonight. I'm really, I'm so excited for tonight. Very trying to help. Very Okay. Hi, Sharon. Hi, everybody on Zoom. Hi, Adrian. Hi, show, Karen. Hi. Oh, that's Karen Miller in the North Shore Weekend. They did a whole article on her, you know, change of art to um, kids with disabilities, and she's amazing. She's going to be here at the center and, and maybe show another province. Sure. Sure. Here. sure. It's so exciting. I, I'm glad she's not here because she probably would be under the table yeah, right now. I'm doing this without her permission, so but I'm so proud of her. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everyone knows Karen Miller, so yeah. Karen, yeah. Karen, yeah. Karen, 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 Okay, so there's lots of excitement in the air, lots of excitement. I just want to say thank you for coming. Just every time I come here and there's like a crowd, I'm like, is there something going on? Like, why is it happening? It's been like two years, but I'm still like, people are here. Is there something happening that I didn't know about? So I just, I'm overwhelmed that you guys keep coming and learning. And I love that we have different generations here, mother and daughter, which makes me emotional. I, I'm just, I want to give a shout out to so your mom up and high and she is shining down and and just this week I didn't see it yet but uh, a beautiful charity box was donated in your mom's memory and merit and it's going to be part of the Lachaim Center so just like I have Bruce over here and your mom's charity box will be at the, at the door I just feel like there's it's not only us it's the souls of those loved ones that believe in us and they're paying for us and they're 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 like there's there's a lot that's happening in this space and maybe that's why it just feels so incredibly awesome 
it's it's beyond us just coming to learn Torah. It's it's a sense of something greater than that. So I'm gonna start. Um, I'm just gonna dedicate today's learning um, in the merit of a three-year-old child that is in the ICU who's need in need of prayers. I don't even have the name, but if we could just channel some some good energy to this child, this Jewish child, uh, is that, I don't know who it is. I don't know if you wanna share anything else, but just just may all the, the, good, the good outcomes and the growth that happens be in the merit of this child. Sue, yeah. Asher Ben Jody needs a Rafua Shalema, 12 year old boy. Okay, there's lots of prayers that we need to bring out there to the world. We have a new visitor that's overwhelmed. Oh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Are you Dean's mom? <laughs> no, okay. No, no, but we're really good friends. Oh, that's <laughs> pretty. She's pretty. Oh, she is. Yeah, uh, yeah pretty. Alalu, I come from Florida. Actually, nice. originally. Thank you for uh, From Peru. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. An accent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So do I, I'm Canadian. <laughs> so, um, my daughter Lucy Deerfield, and ever since the pandemic, I've been coming more and more. So, uh, looking for a place where I could meet people. Oh, welcome. Oh, you're you're so, 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 it's so it's for me or for me? For me. If I am I. I am I. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would love to take your contact information after the class and we can include you on the email. So Thank yes, so welcome. Much. You found your, your home. Yeah, oh. yeah. And and yeah, would you like to share your name? Hi, I'm Paula Goldberg. I'm Sharon's mom. Mm -hmm. And so she's been talking about this place so much. I couldn't <laughs> wait to come. I live in Nashville. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Any other newcomers today? I mean, Don hasn't been here in a while. <laughs> she's an oldie, but good. Okay, so she's coming back after a, a short hiatus. Okay. Yes, okay, it's all good. But welcome she everybody. has an accent, too. Yes, she's an accent. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to start with a story. Okay, story. This is a story. It's a it's a parable. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys to think about the story. Think about the lesson we could learn. We'll we'll try to unpack it as um, a parable. So in Hebrew we call it a mashal and a nimshal. There's like the story and the lesson we could learn from the story. So the story is of a contractor, someone who devoted his life to building homes. Beautiful homes, big homes. Anyone here married to a contractor? Do we have something? Yes. Is that... No, I'm asking Judy to get me a nice coffee. I didn't yeah. know. Ignore me. 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 You might. Okay, back to the parable, back to the story. We have, we have a contractor who has been incredible at his job. He's dedicated and devoted his whole life to this work. He's put up beautiful mansions, incredible, um, you know, incredible works of art. And he is coming towards, you know, he's turning 60 and he thinks I have enough seats in the bank. I don't need so much for the rest of my life. I'm exhausted. I've done this job for so many decades. I think it's time to retire. So he he's ready to move on. He kind of like made that decision in his mind. Many of us here are might have also retired. And you know, when you make that shift, when you're done, you're done. So this guy, he's done. So he goes to his boss and he tells him, it's time. I've devoted, I've done so much for you. I'm ready to step out. There's other younger people that have more energy and creative ideas. I'm done. And the jobs, the boss says, you've been so good at your job, I don't want to let you go. And he says, well, I'm done. So he begs him, he says, could you stay on for one more job? I want you to build one more house for me. Give me one more, give me your best work. And he says, I have nothing left inside of me. I really, I, 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 and they're fighting back and forth, just one more house. And finally, this contractor says, okay, I'll give you one more house. Okay, so six months pass and he finishes the job. And he has not put his whole heart and soul into this job. He has really just kind of gotten through. The floors are not 100% straight. The, there's, the details are not beautiful. It's, it's nothing special. It's really the worst of his work of his entire life. He's not proud of it. But he does the job. He's dragging himself through it. And when he finishes the job, he goes into the office. He tells his boss, OK, I finished my task. I'm good. And the boss calls him into the, the boardroom. 
and every single one of his colleagues and co-workers and the people he's worked with through all the decades, they're all there and they're all smiling so huge and they're all so excited and he's kind of like, what's going on here? And the boss says, on behalf of everyone here, for the dedication and devotion that you put into your work, and he hands him the set of keys. The house is yours. Okay, everyone's laughing. But how does this guy feel? Terrible. He has to go home to his wife. I don't even know. I don't know what he's going home to, but how does he feel inside? He feels like he just lost out big time. He could have built the most magnificent piece had he known that this was going to be his legacy, his gift, his forevermore, he would have gone about it in such a different way. But he didn't because he just thought, I'm going to pass this on like all the other houses that I have nothing left to do with it. It's not me. It's outside of me. So he didn't put any heart into it because he was done. Okay, so what is the parable? What can we think of as a parable in our growth and in our conversation of body and soul? How can we connect to this idea, to this story? Does anyone have an idea? No answer is wrong. Always do your best. Okay, always do your best, because why? You never know who's watching. Yeah, yeah. You never know who's watching, but more for yourself. For yourself. For yourself. Okay, maybe the work that we do is not, we, we might see our Judaism and our growth as having its little place in the corner. Like this is a very normal, normal phenomenon. You know, as, as you grow up and as you raise kids, like, you know, you, you, you live your life and like Judaism, like, you know, you have your high holidays, like, you know, like that's what you do. You take your kids to your Sunday school or, or, or Jewish school, like that's their little time and place for Judaism, but it's almost separate from your whole life. There's a separation. There's almost this dissonance between the actions we do and who we really are. And that doesn't feel good. There shouldn't be a dissonance because if we're spending time doing something, we're supposed to put our heart into it. Do you have another way we could connect these stories? Well, Eve, the whole point about treating others as you would treat yourself or want to be treated, fall from line here because you would hope that somebody else was doing this for you would be as good as Right. You, they would want their home for themselves. Okay, beautiful. So this is actually a Jewish concept that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Do unto others how you would want someone to do unto you. Or, you know, Bain Adam Lechavero, love your fellow as yourself. So there's something that we feel is like, no, 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 that's not such a great Jewish value. He's not putting any effort into it because it's not him. But the Torah tells us that we're supposed to treat people as we would want to be treated. Yeah. Right? So I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is not going to be good for the young <laughs> Eve, from Zoom. Oh, no. <laughs> Judy, sit down. Judy. Go on. <laughs> Ultimately, each of us will be judged by what we've accomplished at the end of our lives. So if you weren't maybe so soul spiritually oriented and growth oriented your whole life, but you, but you come to that and then you continue growing until Hashem takes your soul, then wherever you are at that point. So if you did, this guy did a lot of, you know, he was very accomplished in his life, but then he threw in the towel at the end. Not a Jewish way right. to do things. In fact, it's the all right, right? Mm -hmm. The end of your life when you're so much more spiritually connected because your body is taking a backseat to your soul, that's when things need to ramp up, right? right? But and I and you know, I was actually gonna reach out to Laura this morning. I'm not even gonna look at you, but I was mm -hmm. gonna reach out because it's interesting. I already mentioned your mom, but as I was thinking about this class and the lesson I wanted to to give over, I was thinking of your mom sitting at this class. I think she was here two weeks before she passed. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll never forget that. Like she started late. I mean, she came in, she was barely here for a year of learning off and on between doctor's appointments and definitely not feeling her greatest. But when she came into this room, she was on fire. She was like the president of the Lahive Center. You know, like to, I mean, I have a president, but Randy was the president for that hour. And, and I'll never forget that two weeks, like towards the end of a life, 
you're spending your time in community, trying to gain something, trying to try to grow, to hold on to loftier concepts. That is the lesson that we need to, it's, it's almost like this man from the story, this contractor, he probably felt, if only I had known, if only I had known, well, what if we could bring that to all of our lives? If only I had known, well, maybe we could know. Yes, Bonnie. Well, the first question we're asked when we get up to heaven is, were you honest in business? That's all honest. Right. I mean, listen, a lot of people go through this world giving their mediocre. Right. It's, I don't even know if it's called uh, dishonest because the well, average the person, point? the average Joe Schmo is not putting their heart and soul into their work. Well, there's a difference Does everyone agree with me? Dishonesty you know? and like, okay. I, I don't know if he was dishonest. He just didn't put his, he could have done so much more. And had he known that he was going to benefit, he would have. So it's not, it's not so good and clean and honest, but I don't know if it's dishonest. It's just like very average. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit the other side. Yeah. So what if all your life you do something right, and then one time you don't do it well? Should you, should you be judged just for the one bad thing that you did, and all of your life you did the right thing? Right, right. And maybe the time will come when somebody tells you that enough, just leave the person alone. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's a good thing we're not the judge. I, I don't know how, how people are judged, but we also know that even in the last minute of someone's life, they could acquire the world to come. They could, but their heart could be, open. it might not even be a thing that they do, but it might be a shift in their perspective or an acceptance or, you know, a, a, an uttering of a prayer at the last moment. And we, we have stories like this in the Torah that speak about really bad people that acquired their world to come in one second. So, but once again, we're not the judge. I'm just, it's just a story. How can we relate it? And there's lots of ways to really understand this parable. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say like actions speak louder than words. Like we only know like a small fraction of an individual. Like we think we know our best friends and, you know, but it's like what they do, what they put out there, um, how they treat us. Like that's kind of their, their legacy and how we remember them. And so, you know, this one small act this man did kind of was like his legacy he left right, and the right. reflection of him. And so it's disappointing to him because he probably was, you know, had a lot more, there's a lot so more to more. him. So much more. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad story. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have like a happy ending but I think the lesson for us is very clear to be your best self at all times because we just don't know. First of all, we don't know when our last day is, right? It's a, no one, it's, there's actually three, Three, um, thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, there are three secrets that are, are known in, in the Talmud that speaks about three things that us mortals will never know. One of them is the last day of our life. We don't know our lifespan, right? We, we don't know what our mission is. So we, we don't know how long that mission will take. So that's one of the three. Does anyone just, fun fact, does anyone know what the other two things are that we, that are, we don't know. So one of them is, um, yeah, so our parnasa, no matter how much we work at our livelihood, you could have like the best, you know, degrees from Harvard and you could not have any muzzle and you could not keep a job, right? So parnasa, livelihood, your children, whether you're going to have children, whether you're not going to have children, you have great fertility specialists and treatments nowadays. I mean, you could literally grow a baby in a Petri dish. I mean, there's so much that's happening in the technology advancements. And with all the different, different kinds of families, like you, you see, there's actually a lot of movement right now. I was just talking to oh, a friend of mine that I spent some time with last week in, in Detroit. Um, her, her son, He's an Orthodox gay man who is donating his sperm to an Orthodox couple that lives in Lakeview. Mm -hmm. And they're having this baby. And we were talking about all the ramifications. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, you know, it's so much easier for an Orthodox, for, for a, a couple like two women to have a baby. You get a sperm and, you know, it's done. But for him to have a child, it's a much more complex situation. Mm -hmm. But even with all the technologies and advancements that we have, could everyone have a child? No, I don't even, does anyone know? It's, it's probably in the 90%, but there still is that six to 10% of 
of people that cannot, no matter what you do. So that is one of the secrets. And then the third secret is your life, how long your life will be. We don't know when the last day is, because if we knew that would take away our free will, we would live our lives very differently, right? And God wants us to have this opportunity to do good and to choose good. So our free will is always something that we are in control of, okay? Okay, so going back to this idea, we've been speaking a lot about the soul, right? In the last couple of weeks, we've been speaking of some very deep concepts. Remember when I shared with you that when you're born into this world, your entire soul and all its potential is there. It not, you're not going to, it's like everything is in place, but we are only gifted a small glimpse of our soul at every moment, every possibility. We just have a short, small opening that we could see into that moment, that spiritual choice that we can make. And it's only at the end of our lives that we see the entirety of the soul. Okay, this is really, it's big, big stuff to think about that. Like it's all there, but we only have a glimpse into it. And then at the end of our lives, we see, wow, I could have done so much. And that, just like this man is saying, I should have done more. I, I wish I would have known. That, unfortunately, is at the end of their lives. So like, I known better. Okay, so this is like, there's a lot of some, you know, some really big, strong um, lessons over here. So, um did anyone watch my, my video last night yes. about the, the chapter yeah. of the book? Yeah. Just raise your hand if you didn't see it. Oh, no? Okay. Uh, okay, about half the room. I'm just going to say it really quickly in a nutshell. This is a story that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs shares, mm -hmm. and it's brought down. It was written in the book by Sarah Horowitz. Yeah. If you guys know her, she was the writer for the Obamas. She, she was working in the White House during the Obama reign. Um, she was Michelle Obama's writer, and she is a Jew that has found her Jewish roots, and she's on a, quite a journey now. It was after she left the White House that she started this discovery of, of her roots. And it's called Here All Along, because really she was looking at every other religion, and then re she realized that she had the treasure chest of wisdom and knowledge and meaning in her backyard. So that's usually how it goes. So, so the story that she shares and she writes in her introduction is going into a library and there's tons of books, cover, you know, floor to ceiling, just like so many books and every topic, so much content in that room. And you go in and you could choose anything, you could pull anything off the shelf. But as she's choosing the book that she wants to sit down and read, she sees a book that has on the spine her family name. So intrigued, she pulls it out. And she flips through and it's an interesting kind of book. The pages are different. The handwriting is different from chapter to chapter. And she realizes that this is the book of her family ancestry through all the generations. So some of the pages were like tarnished and old and ripped and the writing was different. And she realizes, wow, every chapter, one leads to the next and leads to the, ne to the next. And she flips through this entire book and she sees that the last chapter of the book is empty. There's an empty few pages, but on the head of it is her name. What a powerful, what a powerful story to think about that she now has to write the next chapter. And really all of us are writing the next chapter in our family's history and in the destiny of the Jewish people, right? And, and that was my message. It was, I was very inspired by my, uh, the, the closing ceremony of the Bat Mitzvah Dorot program that was on Sunday. And I share that story with the girls. It was just to think like, if this is the future. It's not us, we're old. Like, you know, we're not gonna create so much more change in our lives. I mean, hopefully we will on personal level. But, <laughs> sorry, talk to yourself. You know, I mean, 12, 13 year olds, and it's emotional to think like they have the power. Like they're gonna be the future. The decisions, and it's kind of, Katie, you look, you look scared, right? It, it could be. <laughs> do need to empower them to know they're the future of the Jewish people. Like that's the next, I mean, we're going to write our chapter. We're writing it right now, but they're going to have the next chapter. Like it's, it's really, you know, Lori Palatnik, she, she once said, when you see a Jewish cemetery, you know that there was a past. When you see a Jewish synagogue, you know, there's a present. But if you see a Jewish institution or a school that teaches Judaism, you know there's going to be a future. She, I remember this lesson. It was very powerful. She says, it's not about us. 
it's not about us. It, whether we stay Jewish, that's great. Or, you know, whether we do or don't, it's important stuff. But the question is, are our children going to be Jewish? Are our grandchildren going to be Jewish? That's the scariest question of all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I read a piece in the New York Times today talking about how religion was on the decline, like the big time. Yeah. And then I watched your video and it yeah. was like that. Wow. Really Could you send me the piece? Was. Yeah. Okay. Is it sad? Yeah, it's like majorly a decline. People are leaving religion. Right. I mean, every there's synagogues worldwide are shutting down or merging. I, I just heard about another one in Chicago that's closing down. Um, it, it's yeah, definitely we, we see that. I don't know what's happening outside the Jewish world, but um, and I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to read what they're pointing fingers at. Like, why is it that um, organized religion is not a thing anymore? Yes. Well, lucky for us, lucky for Jewish people, we believe that Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is a relationship. So lucky for us that it's not about the synagogue. If the synagogues all shut down, we could still be vibrant, connected Jews. When the whole world shut down with COVID, Jewish homes have never been in such booming business than that first COVID, that first Passover, you know, usually Arab Passover, I'm like, you know, peeling carrots and potatoes, guiding so many people in how to make their first Passover Seder on their own, because there was never more Passover Seders in the history of the Jewish people <laughs> than on that COVID year, when I'm everyone was shocked. locked up at home, and as scary <laughs> as it seemed, and I did, you know, I definitely had my breaking points at certain point, like it was scary, but it was like, that's everything we believe. Judaism, synagogue is a part of Jewish life. It's like a pie, there's a pie. There's so many different parts of Jewish life. Most Jews think synagogue is such a big part of the pie. So when they're not feeling connected at synagogue, they're like, I'm just gonna throw it all away. So I think that's what's happening, but they're not seeing the other nine out of 10 pieces of, of you know, between man and man and business ethics and family home and the way that we live with morals and values. That, those are equal parts, this incredible, relationship with Judaism that we have and connection to God, to our creator, to our divine source. I mean, these are big things. Okay, so what we're going to do right now, we're going to pass these out. We're going to take pause for a second, if you could pass, and if you could pass, and, oh, you know, maybe I'll keep one. <laughs> we're going to take pause because we have been learning this topic for two years, uh, almost two years, more or less. We've done a lot, we've thrown a lot of other things in talking about character traits of Jewish women, and we've done a lot of learning on Tuesday mornings. And once again, we have finished another book. We are like going through these books, like, you know, very quickly. We've done probably four or five books since in the last two years. And we're at the end. We finished, tip, uh, you know, technically we finished this book. I am going to just sum it up a little bit with her, her closing chapter right now. And what I'd like to do is to take stop. Okay, and for the newcomers, by the way, you're coming at the perfect time. It doesn't matter what, like, where you jump in. I'd like to take a stop. I'd like you guys to do, you know, take five minutes or, or take two minutes. Thank you. Yeah, sure. um, yeah you guys could share. It's fine. You can, you can share it on your phone. Whatever you want to do. To the workers. To the Thank you. And this is a really, really open, honest question that it's solely for you. I want to know if we have moved the needle. Have we moved the needle or is it just fluffy talk? Have we actually, you know, this is a great quote that Adrienne Gould says. She says, inspiration without perspiration equals no concretization. No what? No concretization. <laughs> I don't even know that's, that's a word. But that's what she said. She made a thing. If you don't perspire, if you don't put some work, some oil to the, you know, then what do you get at the end of the day? So I'd like to know if we have moved the dial even a tad. By the way, the head of the Musser movement, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter from over a thousand years ago, he says that if you could change one trait in your entire life, 
you have had a successful growth oriented life okay? mm -hmm. one trait he says even to change one trait from negative to positive is not a small thing and not a given meaning most people do not actually change a trait. Mm -hmm. so it's hard work it really but we know it's possible and i feel like we've been talking about a lot of things i'm going to just read some of the some of the topics that we spoke about just in this book alone we spoke about judgment forgiveness, acceptance, speech, silence, renewal, happiness, and generosity. Those were the topics in this book. But there are so many other topics that we've been talking about all year, like honesty and humility and flexibility and laziness and result, which is alacrity, like getting things done and selfish versus selfless, um, jealousy or being happy for other people. We've spoken about all of these incredible traits and actually considering like as, as we finish this book now, and I'm looking for the next book, which I started, I started going, I went back to Alan Marinas. So, was, I did that with a few of his books this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with, with Heart and Mind was one of them. So, um, so I went back to Alan with, I, I really, really love his, right? I mean, I'm gonna read you guys some of his teachings today. It's so deep and profound. He used to come. He used, used to be, I used to learn with him. Really? Is he from Chicago originally? I, he was here for, wow, wow. So Alan Marinus, I highly, highly recommend looking up his teachings. He actually, in his introduction over here, so he came to study Musser. He, he was a pretty secular Jew, a spiritual Jew. And he had a really, really hard time even throwing himself into the study because everyone he was studying from was orthodox and he's like i'm never going to be orthodox so like how can i connect to this but he was very driven to the teachings that were brought down through the orthodox rabbis throughout the last thousand oh years because he just felt there was there was something in it that talked to his soul and so his introduction to this book is actually you hear him grappling with like how he's like i'm never going to be that i'm never going to do shabbat i'm never going to do this so like can i even take some of the goodies out of out of this and he, and he actually says yes you could like just jump in. I mean, I I don't know what he's like today. I'm assuming he's he's fully in. Like I'm. Yeah, but you would. But he's a regular. He's guy. a regular guy. Okay, that makes me happy. I mean, he's he the way he writes. I mean, he's a brilliant mind and very educated. And I don't know, just thought provoking every word. I'm gonna read some of his wisdom today, and I'm thinking that maybe we will shift this class after we take a little bit of an assessment of like if you know personal assessment if that um that needle a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we will turn to a different topic, which is man and, and God. So until now, we've been learning about man and man, our interpersonal relationships. And now I'm thinking, I don't want to scare everyone off, but I'm thinking maybe we can learn a little bit more about God. Needs, because we are a piece of God. So that's what I'm thinking of. I'm doing some research in this topic. So stay tuned for more. Okay, so before we, we take this assessment, I'm going to just share a little bit from the closing of this book. So learning about Musser, about bettering yourself, has it, it brings about many triggers or annoyances. Okay, there's there's certain moments where people have had meltdowns in this class. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> Um, there, and that's good. That's good. Actually, you know, last night we had this incredible session here uh, for young moms. It was a topic on how to how to how to navigate being in the sandwich generation, taking care of elderly parents and taking care of young kids. It was fabulous. And after the event, like Dana was like, someone's crying in the kitchen, and there's two ladies <laughs> crying in the kitchen, and I felt so bad. Right? I felt like it triggered them. But you know what I realized after the best thing, first of all, how cleansing it is if someone is going through something to cry it out. It was okay. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be triggered. Like, it's a gift. One was comforting the other, but they both ended up crying. And I got I got a call from the oh. Yeah. Yeah. Gail led us in an incredible, um, incredible session. And we're actually gonna open it up to the larger community and we're gonna do a part two if anybody wants to come because we realize just how important this topic is. So Thank you, Gail. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there are triggers, <laughs> triggers along the way and annoyances and things that we're kind of like opposed to. Like when I'm sure everyone at some point has hated me for saying, right, Laura, I'm looking at you. Hi, I'm looking at you, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love you, Eve. I love you too. Okay. 
Yes. So there are, so, so part of that yes. is yes. Do this? seeing those Bring triggers it. as opportunities for growth. Okay. We, we, we spoke about this like two years ago, how when a, a friend of mine, he, he like bumped into another car in Israel, I mean, like the parking is very tight and he hit another car and the guy comes out and he, he thinks like he's going to be screamed at. And this guy goes, OFG. <laughs> and he's like, what? And he says, opportunity for growth. <laughs> he, like, he thought he was going to like swear at him, but this guy was like, this is an opportunity for growth. So sometimes those bumps along the way, great, wow, use that. Sometimes those bumps along the way, those triggers are a window into your work. Okay, I'm going to just take a pause for a second. Going back to a topic that we spoke about before the high holidays, I did a whole five-week session on finding what your mission is, whoever was here for that, mm. your yi'ud, your destination, mm -hmm. and also finding your tikkun, your rectification, the part that needs fixing in you. We all are born with a mission. Remember we did this work with the diagram? The, yeah. the, the, I remember, Angie, you, I remember you were like, oh my gosh, I thought that was my mission. <laughs> we're still working on it. It's a, it's a work in progress, but you were given a window into like, you know, insight into what your soul's mission is and what you're fixing is. And we all have it. And, and the way that I described figuring out what you're fixing is, that negative trait, and this is how I described it, if you would uproot that negative trait by the, the root, it would change everything else in your life. That's how you know it is your, that is your character trait. That is your fixing. It's so vital because it affects everything else that happens in your life. Mm -hmm. And usually these big traits are, are very big. It could be ego. It could be anger. It could be like, it just the sense of low self-esteem always, always comes up as a core trait that if you lifted that somehow with therapy and help and learning and growth and opportunities, it would literally change every relationship, how you see yourself, how other people see you, it would be a game changer. Okay. So we've spoken a lot about those things that there's, you know, for those of you that have not taken that five week course about figuring out your mission and your, and the part that you need to fix, I'm happy to do it again. Cause I think it's that important. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll do it again. Maybe we'll book a time for the summer leading up to high holidays. We could do like four sessions over the summer. Whoever missed it, I think it's really important. Or you could do it again. <laughs> but, and also, by the way, I do this every year before high holidays. I've been doing it for over 10 years. Every year I do that diagram. Every year I ask myself the same questions. And as, we, as time goes, we change. Circumstances change. So the whole mission is different. So it's really important. Maybe we all want to do it again. I'm happy to do it again, but for the whole group. Okay, so now we're back to these opportunities for growth. And, um, okay. So I'm just gonna just sum up this book. So she's, she talks about how this work is life-changing. And it also obviously takes a lot of hard work. We may have to hint, we may have a hint of arrogance or a lack of self-awareness. We may be impatient, perhaps a little lazy. These are all character traits. Like we, we have a little bit of a lot of things, right? Hard to find that one root cause that is the negative cause of our life, right? Because there's so many different things. And we may feel discouraged, right? Because we're like, I'm a mess, right? I said to Julia as she walked in. <laughs> How are you handling so much? And I'm like, I'm a hot mess. Five million balls in the air. There's a lot of balls in the air. So that's, it's, it's a really hard, I mean, for me, it's balance, right? I, I get very, right? I know she's taking me to a sound bath. I need that. I, yeah, very just excited. Shut it down for now. <laughs> so I'm going to just, I'm just going to close this book with her final quote. This is a famous story. This is the story of, as I just mentioned, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the founder of the Muslim movement over a thousand years ago. So these are his words. When I was a young man, I wanted to change the world, but I found it was difficult to change the world. So I tried to change my country. When I found I couldn't change my country, I began to focus on my town. However, I discovered that I couldn't change my town. And so as I grew older, 
I tried to change my family. That's the hardest. Mm -hmm. Now, as an old man, I realized the only thing I could change is myself. But I've come to recognize that if long ago I had started with myself, then I could have made an impact on my family mm -hmm. and my family could have made an impact on our town. And that in turn could have changed the country and we could all indeed have changed the world. Mm -hmm. By the way, what does that sound like? Momentum. That's the momentum yeah. mission statement. Isn't it crazy? I, agree. I, I, I actually, I just realized it now. I agree. As I read this, I'm like, because momentum, this organization that has taken 23,000 Jewish moms, their mission statement in a nutshell is really paraphrasing this. Change a woman, change a family, inspire a community and change the world. That's it. If you if you inspire a woman, she inspires her family. That's why they only take women that have kids 18 and under, right? Because mm -hmm. they want the greatest impact for the bang of their buck, right? And if you inspire a family, you literally are inspiring a community. That's, I mean, a lot of the fuel that that, that flows through L'Chaim Center is from this mission statement and from that one tool that we use. It's just a tool, right? Momentum is just one tool, right? It's just one of the things we do here but there's a lot of power that flows in that direction. We have changed our community, okay? Yeah. To have young moms coming on a weeknight to learn and to talk about meaningful things, that is not happening in most communities, okay? But it's happening here. So are we changing the world? Yes. yes. And that was what Yisrael Salantra said. It's about changing yourself. Mm -hmm. So now I'd like everyone to take a few minutes. Just if you have a page, if, um, is, any, is anyone missing a page? Sure. Sorry. Okay. I can. Okay. So I, I'd love for, if you have a pen, and we do have pens here. If anyone needs, I'd love for you just like make a plus, make a minus, make a number one to ten. This is for you. No, if you feel like you're doing good in your growth, right? Maybe do it one to ten, right? I want you guys to look through some of these character traits. Some are positive, some are negative. Well, no, where are you? Yeah, where are you in your in your loyalty, in your laziness, in your respect? Like, I want to know if you feel like you're doing good. Is it five to ten, or is it one to five? However you want to mark it, however you want to write it, this is for you. But let's just have two minutes of quiet just to go through this. Ten is the highest. Yeah, I mean, it's however you want to mark it. I know. Each one, one through five. <laughs> however you want. One through ten. Going to the letter and school. Is there something that has to do with this right this year? Okay, you got to clarify. Oh, right. Oh, no, no, no. I, just, I, I want you to be like what you do. Like picking things out originally. It's really for you. I just want you to give an assessment of how you're doing. Like, you know, not all of them are so, like, let's say active. Like, Julie, you get a 10. <laughs> she plays pickleball like more than I, you know, breathe. So, so you know what I mean? Like, there's certain things, then that's a good trait. It's a good trait. So, <laughs> but you are brilliant. You are brilliant. Okay, let's give it two more minutes. Um, it's like, I didn't say one, 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 one
I started up with a zero to five, and I changed it to ten, and then I stopped. Too many choices. Did you get the special? Oh, wow. yeah. 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 Which one do you relate to? Okay, so as you guys want to add, I'm going to close this class with some of this profound Jewish wisdom by Alan Marinus. So I just like give me a look at look at me if you're done, and if you, you still need another minute, Bana, you need another minute. Yeah, okay. one more minute now. Yeah. Um, with this Lucer practice, um, Rupi Cabal um, she encourages you to share when you have a Lucer win with a friend. And it just kind of brings it all home and connects it, um, makes you like think, you know, think different. Oh, well, that's a nice thing to do. Well, well, they share what we share. share. Okay, you know? like, what's like an example of like, you know, somebody's, you know, you didn't lose your lose it when it came to scheduling or. Somebody caught in front of you at the grocery store, or somebody that like, triggered you, and you just like kept silent as one of them. Or you or... said OFG. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think it's something I've been really working on since my momentum trip. It's something that you covered, and that I really take it home. And I think it's now working with my family um, and other people around me is that I really try to be tolerant of other people when they do something rude or disrespectful or. Mm -hmm just say something not nice. Um, and actually last night we were at a restaurant and the waitress was not so friendly. It was very grumpy. And, um, and okay, you're grumpy. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's <laughs> reaction at first was like, whoa. Like she said like, you know, okay, what salad dressing do you want? I don't have all day, I just pick one, you know. Mm -hmm. And so okay, I said, you don't know, but my dad kept saying, well, we're, we're going to knock it over. And I said, let's just wait. There's probably yes. something going on in her life that yeah. is causing her to be this way. Wow. And I, I I've, been, of this out. I've been really working on that. Okay. And later on in the evening, we found out she had had a stroke and they were so kind to let her continue working there. And that wow. was wow. really hard for her. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, everybody, we all changed Very our nice tune. Nice. 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 Right. And yeah, like the people, people were being rude to her because she yeah. was like unable to do like her job in the easiest oh, way. I love it. I love it. Okay, so this is this is a great segue into some of this wisdom because Alan is writing over here that in Musar, in this work, the most important practice we can do is to develop the intent to lift up our daily interactions. Did you feel mm -hmm. like you just elevated the moment? Mm -hmm. And 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 everyone around you, whoever was at the table with you also felt this elevation. Yeah. The Very person good. felt yeah, less yeah, judged. I mean, true. this, and it could have had ripple effects. Yeah. Like who knows, maybe she was kinder to her family when she got home some work, who knows? Mm -hmm. Ripple effects that all because of you, right? It really, it's beautiful. But this is what it's all about. It's lifting up our daily interaction. <laughs> I love you because you talk about it. <laughs> it's all because of Hashem. Okay. <laughs> Um, with others and with ourselves. So it's it's really, it's not only us because everything we're doing here in interpersonal relationships starts within and it goes outwards and upwards. Okay, so there's like three relationships that we're always, always balancing, inner, outer, and upper. Okay, so this is, you just did it. You got like standing ovation in heaven. Okay, so the upper world is connected to your will, the, the interactions and your own personal will. Okay. So our relationships with other people are most always where we face our biggest challenges. And so if we look at them correctly, they can also be our richest opportunity to do the work on ourselves that will bring about profound and lasting inner changes. I'm, I'm gonna skip, I'm just skipping a little bit through so much of the wisdom over here. So he says, first of all, leaning forward as if that would help to get the point across. This is him talking to someone, to a Musur giant. It all revolves around the purpose. I have to come to understand the observance of these rules and the laws that we follow and the way that we're sanctifying life and how we create a place for God's presence on earth. Okay, In that restaurant, you created a space for God to flow in. Like that's, it's literally, we do, it's called Sim Tsum. It's us taking a step back, not always jumping forward, but, but kind of contracting a little bit, that creates spaces for God's heavenly divine presence to flow into our lives. So that's what this musr, this holiness is, is really about. It's bringing holiness into a person, bringing godliness. That's the goal of it all. 
it's just skipping along. So there's um, a big chapter over here about the soul, which we've been speaking a lot about. There's actually three parts to the soul, okay? What's the Hebrew word for soul? Neshama. You guys all know that word. But we've spoken about different parts of the neshama. The neshama is actually only one of the three parts. There's nefesh, ruach, and neshama. Okay, those are the three parts. The neshama is the most elevated part of our soul. It's, um, it's the place where there's like this lamp of glory, like so to speak, in my body, he has kindled a lamp um, from his glory. That's like one of the great commentators, even Ezra, he writes about it. Um, the, um, in our morning prayers, we say, God, the soul that you have given me is pure. We say in all our, our prayers, we use the word neshama. Okay, so we all know that. Parents want their children to be protected from the dangers in the world because they see the neshama of the child. A parent sees the purity of a child. Has any parent here ever felt like they want to just protect their child from a negative influence or a bad kid or, or you know, like as if our kids are angels, but yes, okay, everyone's bad. But we, have you ever called the school to say, I want my son or my child to be in a different group or a different crowd, or I'd like to switch partners for a project, or, right? It's because we see the purity of their soul. I love, can I share what you just told me? Oh, and, uh, you shared me? such a brilliant thing, and I shared it with my kids even to get their take on it. But <laughs> okay. with your kids, about <laughs> so smoking for it. or drugs. Oh, oh, it was so good. This was a great conversation at my Shabbos table. Okay. So tell us. So I, my husband and I, uh, we didn't want our children to drink or smoke. So we put $2,000 in cash on the kitchen table. And we called both of our kids in. And we're like, you know, is this a lot of money? And they're like, holy cow, it's a lot of money. And I'm like, do you want it? They're like, yeah. I'm like, you can have it on your 21st birthday, provided you don't smoke ever and you don't do drugs. And they said, I go, this is just an honest thing. This is just, uh, you know, I'll give this to you on your 21st birthday. I'll take you to Las Vegas and it's yours if you do. And they said, well, how will you know? I go, it's an honesty thing. You're going to have to be honest with me. And so it puts, it puts thought in their mind whether or not it's worth it because they know that there's something on the line. And I think if they could get to 21 without ever putting a cigarette or even, a, and I said, not even a gummy, but <laughs> don't have to actually no chew it. The drugs are alcohol. Well, I don't know. Uh -huh. What's up with that? Maybe I should go in reverse it. But like, you know, I just don't want them to smoke. Okay. I think yeah. it's just too hard so to, to stop that. <laughs> so there are times that I, it's, that's what we did. Okay. And I told them that on the first birthday, we're all going to Vegas, hopefully. Wow. Oh, but but it does make them think about it twice, whether or not it's worth it. Isn't that amazing? I, 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 so I, I learned that from you. I brought it home. I discussed it with my team. Yeah, what they say. They were like, that is too hard. So, but bottom line, why did you do that? Because yes. you see your kids' purity. Yeah. You see their soul. By the way, oh, no okay. one I sees the soul of a child the way the, the mother does, mother and father. No one sees their potential. You, you're given a glimpse. You gave them their name. You gave them their essence. You have such a spiritual, you, you know, bringing a child into this world is mother, father, and God, right? Or an adoption agency or whatever it is. But there's so much godliness in the process, right? And the most amazing, the most amazing story of, of an adoption process that I, I for sure heard from Neely Cousins yeah. Did you ever hear her story of, of a child that, that grows up? She always, she, she knows, she, she knew she was chosen. And she said the most, but every single night, her mother tells her the story of her adoption, how she went from bed to bed to bed in the orphanage or wherever it was. And she said, I looked through all the beds. I found the most beautiful child. And this child tells over the story. She says, the most beautiful words I have ever heard are, I chose you. Mm -hmm. It's because you see something. You see a purity of soul. You see an opportunity for growth. Okay, so that's what he's saying over here. That is the nishama. 
you see the neshama, a parent sees it, sees it in their child. So we have that high level. We have the ruach. The ruach is the spirit of life, right? Which is more animalistic and bigger. And then the, the nefesh is the part of the soul that's connected to the body, okay? So this is, this is the more visible and accessible part to us. It includes the physical body. The body is connected to the soul, right? W without the body, the soul can't be here. So this is the, the, very, the very tangible part of the soul. Okay, so, so, so listen to some of this beauty. So the body and soul are in fact a single indivisible whole. Without the soul, the body is dust. Without sensation of the play of physical forces, the soul has no connection to the earth. It's the union of body and soul that gives rise to human experience. You had a spiritual experience in that moment, choosing the elevated uh, choice of how to react in that moment. You're just bodies, but you're choosing to connect to your soul, to your elevated part, okay? So, okay, so, so this is something interesting. If your nefesh, if that animal, not, not the animal part, but if, if the part, the body part of your soul, the, more, the, the most rounded of the parts is clear and unblemished, which I'm not sure what that means, the light of your soul will shine through without obstruction. If it's foggy, the light will be obstructed, okay? Now, I'll just pause over here for a second. Going back three weeks ago, we had our annual campaign. I cried at least five times that day because people that like really care about me literally either didn't have answer the phone or slammed it down on my face. Literally, it was so I so much rejection that in one day it was really hard. I mean, I'm not super sensitive, but I was in tears. And my husband told me at one point midday, take a break, call a friend, talk about something else. So I called a dear friend, Kavura Davis. She she does what I do in Philadelphia. And she cries me, she calls me to cry when she's having that day. So like, I thank God I have her. So I told her what I'm going through. And she said to me, this, this piece of wisdom. She said, Eve, if someone is not able to see you and what you're asking for, that you, you have such good intentions. If someone is not even capable of giving $18, she says, what do you expect? Some people's souls are so obstructed Think about all that people take in, all the negativity, all the negative influences and forces, all the impurity, all the, all the, all the schmutz out there. It affects our soul. When she told me that, I, I had a, a bit of a paradigm shift because I honestly felt bad. If someone has so, they, they have nothing, but they can't even, not even to say I can't, I love you anyways, good luck. Like not even that, but just like, not, you know, if someone has no kindness to give and to put out into the world, I feel like, I mean, I'm more sad for that person mm -hmm. than for me, right? And she, this is what he calls it. He says, the souls could get obstructed. He uses the word foggy. It gets foggy because we need to clean it out. We need to have that flow of goodness and, and holiness. But in this experience, in this life with a lot of darkness, it could get a little, we need to wash those windows a little bit. Okay, so I'm, I'm just jumping to a few more, few more chunks and I'm, we're going to be finished in just two, three minutes. If you have to go, Mwah. Doris, we'll see you too. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump a little bit. Okay, this is very profound. He says, it's not whether we have the traits. Okay, the traits, look at your sheet. It's not whether you have the you have all of them. All of us have all of them. But where we fall on the continuum, what number you gave yourself, if you're like, you know, failing, if you're getting twos consistently in, in good traits that need to be five, six, seven, honestly, right? Where you fall on the continuum, that gives our distinctive personality, our way of being in this world. So the question is, like going back to the beautiful, you know, introduction and the story that I shared about the chapter, how do you want your chapter to be written? What are you going to write in your chapter? Do, do you want to be like that construction worker that gave a mediocre job? We're talking on a soul level. So over here, the continuum where we fall with all the different traits that we, we have them all. We have negativity. Everything has a flip side. The question is where you fall 
That is your way of being in the world. That is how your chapter is going to be written. That is how you're going to create your last piece of art. That house, that may, is it going to be magnificent, right? That's, that's the balance. That's the continuum, okay? When we age, we are shaped by experiences and environment or more deliberately by spiritual practices. And we spoke about that when we spoke about the soul, how as we get older, we're less connected to our body. We, have, we tend to sleep more. We need more sleep as we age because our body doesn't need to be so present. And as people, you know, my very dear friend passed away this week, Sharona Lori. Some of you might have read what I wrote about her on, on Facebook. She was 70 years old. She just celebrated her 70th birthday. Thank God, thank God, I was able to travel to Portland right before Pesach and spend an entire day with her, just holding her hand and sitting next to her and talking about things of, of depth and spirituality because she is someone that took all the teachings and that's how she lived her life. An incredibly spiritual, creative, connected person. So much so that towards the end of her life, she knew she was not afraid. She did her work. She was going to get the mansion that she built. It was so clear to her and there was no fear. I thought I was going there on my last trip to visit her. I thought I was going to comfort her and to tell her it's going to be okay. It's the opposite. She comforted me. She was so ready. A week before she passed, she told all her friends and family she's ready. She said she feels her soul pulling away from her body. She, she was so in tune. Her daughter was flying from Israel with her two grandchildren. She wanted to wait. Her daughter arrived on Wednesday. It was literally my friend, Tony Jaffe, was sitting with her. And my friend texted me, I don't even know if she's alive. She had labored breathing. We thought she was gone. I mean, I was with a bunch of ladies in, at the conference. And I said, my friend is passing. That was on Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, her daughter arrived. I thought, okay, she waited for her daughter. Thursday, Friday, Arab Shabbos, I'm like, you know, her family said, we're not taking any more phone calls. She's still with us. I said, she's waiting for Shabbat. Shabbat morning, I was here. Heather Rossi, one of my friends that was with me in New Jersey, she came, she said, um, any news? And I said, she's waiting for Shabbat. I'm sure she's going to pass today. As soon as Shabbat was over, I got the message that her soul left Shabbat morning. Literally, while I was talking about her, that was when, that was around the time that her soul passed with so much peace, with so much clarity, like so beautiful, so incredibly beautiful. She passed away holding her daughter's hand in a bubble of love. She had her ex-husband there and her, and her Previous husband that she threw out. <laughs> I mean, this lady was like, no nonsense. Like you, she was a powerhouse of a woman and everyone that ever loved her was there surrounding her because, you know, she was love. She was light. She was growth. She wasn't an observant woman, but I, I feel, I, I, I literally just spending time with this woman, I feel humbled and embarrassed about my own spirituality. Because it doesn't, it's, it's not about observance. It's about, it's about living your life with the clarity and walking with God. She walked with God her whole life. So that's Sharona Luri. May her soul rest Amen. in peace. And it's just flying high. Amen. And um, yeah. Um, okay. We're going to change the clock sign. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me just. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I love you. Do you have to go? You have yeah. To go. Bye. Bye. Okay, okay, wait. So, so this is just have a good day, everybody. Literally the last paragraph, okay? Last, last paragraph, okay? This is the end of this chapter. As these insights took hold, this is Alan Marinus writing. I came to see the soul as a precious gift I wanted to care for with love. I began to feel compelled to cut through whatever blockages were obstructing my way to realizing the fullest potential of the soul, which is revealed when we uncover and live in the light of holiness that shines within. And as I took little steps and made a little progress in that direction, these ideas infiltrated my behavior. It wouldn't really matter if I had perceived that my actions emanate from the soul, unless that perception changed the way I acted. Okay, so, so this is how, this is the question that he ends with. When I look into the eyes of the person across from me, was that a soul I saw? When I did see a soul in myself or in another, kindness and consideration seemed to arise naturally. So that's what we're going to leave.
everyone with today. Obviously, this pursuit is to weigh more heavily on our soul. We are a soul. We have a body. We're going to exercise our soul in this world. It's not going to have its little box, its little time and place, like most Jews have their little place for their Judaism. No, we're going to try to, to, to walk in this world more as a soul, less like a body, focusing on things that really matter and make a difference. But the next level is seeing every single person in front of us as another soul. First, we need to do it for ourselves. Then we need to see that lady who's struggling, who's having a hard day as your waitress, as a soul. She also has a piece of the divine inside of her. She is a soul. She has a body. Her body might be struggling. Yes. That's it's really interesting. And I, I hear what you're saying. What if there's someone in your life that isn't going anywhere and everyone is a soul. How do you get, it's a very loaded question, right? Like I'm working on finding myself and doing all the work. How do I get past and just being able to like be in the same room or, you know, in-, in So can we do it with our kids? Like that example and what you shared? Could we see the, the soul in our kids? The answer is yes. Yeah. Right. Even like a convicted felon is like has a mother that thinks he's <laughs> such a good boy. <laughs> like we can all see the good in our child. Right. Okay. So that I think we could all agree. Yes. Mostly. Most sometimes yeah. they give us a run for our money. Right. But I guess the next level, so you're you and then the people that you created. Yes. Mm -hmm. We see a soul. There mm -hmm. is that small window at every point. And then that it's the more difficult people in our lives, like the inner circle, mm -hmm. it's easier possibly to see it with the waitress because you don't need to go home with the waitress, mm -hmm. right? So certain, you know, it's there's concentric circles around our lives, uh, around our relationships. And sometimes that's the homework that you have, right? I think you also said in the book, changing you changes color, yeah. you know? So yeah. you can't, well, you know, I know it's easier said than done, but right. if it's changing yourself, I don't know if that helps but, change yeah. people around. It's like, hard. Yeah. If, if it's hard for you to be with this person because they're not meshing with your morals or values, mm -hmm. like sometimes I just say to myself, that's all they're capable of at this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just like, like, let it go. Let it go. Like, don't, you it's know, like, it. even if it's your family. Right. <laughs> like, it's like, not like yeah. they're bad or they're wrong or I hate that they don't get what I'm saying. It's just like, that's what they're capable of right now for whatever that's reason good. happened in their life. That's really and try to just move on. It's really profound. It's yeah. really hard to do. You know what I've what? found? I've run into it. I've run into a couple of people in the last year that just set my teeth on it. And you know, <laughs> never heard that one before. I love them. I love them. <laughs> so, and and I, when I'm around them, I know that I must have what's referred to as a look on my face. Arresting. And, and on and on. And I probably do, do something or go or whatever. And finally, I sat down with the first human one to give up. I said, what is it about this person that just starts to And it turns out uh, this person has some qualities. They're exactly like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they hold up a mirror. No. Like, the light is annoying. <laughs> and then I the only other one who offended me the first time I spoke to him. And um, and now months later, I look and I say, you know, there's something else going on there. I can see her coming out. Now that I can heal. Just no mm -hmm. can you know? So maybe an interesting question is why don't you like how someone talks to you? I always see that as a challenge to see what I can do to make them smile. And mm -hmm. of course you probably don't know what. But <laughs> on the other hand, maybe it's also that you don't like to be disrespected. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important and I think a good quality. Mm -hmm. So maybe you give that person more respect. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But when it all came home to you know my mailbox, mm -hmm. 
So, so I'll just give both of you like uh, just a piece of Jewish wisdom. So the Hebrew word to love, the root of it is hav, which means to give. And this is a tool that Judaism teaches us because the etymology of words, there's always a message there. That if you really want to love someone, someone that might even be very difficult to rub you the wrong way, give to them. The more you give, the more you love. So we'll end with that. And we'll see you guys next week. I will see you, I mean, this tonight, hopefully. Not tonight. I'm so excited for the class tonight. Thank you for staying. Oh, yeah, we're all all the same and people that I don't so that's I was fine. I mean we often show up very difficult situation. Better than I was there with at least three clients. My daughter didn't want to be so people Oh, you got those reverses. Wow, this is very cool. I've never seen the glasses like that coming closer. That's my eye doctor, right? Oh, yeah. Dr. Rosie. He's never on time. And he always changes my appointment. Yeah. It just is what it is. I know. I know. I know. I I I had no idea because we know she was really sick for a very long time. Yeah. This kid that is right. right. they went to camp together. His son, their son. And then he never had a chance. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, John, he just walked into the worst. I mean, he knows. He's great. I mean, he's a great doctor, and I admire him. But the office I hate. And yeah, I'm just, I, I didn't know that it was a Oh, he's No, he's great. I guess we hear his problem. That's how it's like. I was not saying anything bad about him. He's the best. He can't retire on me. <laughs> I've got questions because I can't remember. Good to see you. All right. Yeah. 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 All I know is Jen left me a message and said, life's been really hard with Noah and their aunt. So I don't know what's going on. She's that? Noah is, or a dad. 
Yeah, so I don't know what I kind of know. That was just her message and we all started. I mean, I didn't start. I didn't start together, but we started our like journey. Like, I mean, I Okay, let's go. I know we're just making it a change. Um, yeah, but we were talking about, you know, the credit card problem with chicken ties, so. I know. When there are so many people, I mean, we have to make changes. There's so a lot of only take. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, 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 so